All right. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining our California Coastal Resilience Network webinar today. My name is Carrie Boyle. I'm the coordinator of this network, and I'm also a state sea grant fellow at the Coastal Conservancy. So I will be facilitating today's webinar. Um, we have set aside time at the end for our speakers to answer questions. So please feel free to type up your questions in that questions box that you see in your GoToWebinar window, and we'll um, definitely take time at the end to go through those. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coastal Conservancy's YouTube page, and I'll send a link to that in a follow-up email. And we have a whole lot of great content to cover today, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Today's speakers, um, let's see if my PowerPoint wants to respond. There we go. Um, today's speakers, um, first of all, the, uh, the mayor of Imperial Beach, Mayor Serge Zadina, will start us off and then Dr. David Revel of Revel Coastal will speak about the vulnerability assessment from Imperial Beach and physical adaptation responses. And he followed the mayor's lead and submitted a surfing picture, but he has also provided a more standard photograph for you. <laughs> um, and then after that, we'll hear from Dr. Phil King from um, San Francisco State University. And finally, from Chris Helmer, who is the city of Imperial Beach's environmental and natural resource director. So thank you so much to the four of you for presenting in today's webinar. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Mayor Serge Dardina. Well, hey, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, we're great to have folks from all over the state. Obviously, this is an important issue and one that the city of Imperial Beach sort of uh, didn't take, hasn't taken lightly. And so just the background, we're a city of 28,000 people, the last town on the California coast probably the only remaining blue collar beach town left in Southern California, a small beach city with a, a, a poverty rate of 25% um, and a very demographically uh, uh, diverse community, uh, more like a, a typical border city. So um, we don't have a lot of money to address some of these issues, but we did have a great team to help us start understanding the impacts of sea level rise. And so, um, what I think has made a difference with our city, and I think you'll see from the team assembled here, is that ultimately um, a few factors have gone into what's been our process. First, we were in sync with our uh, agency partners, the California Coast Conservancy and the California Coast Commission. We assembled a really uh, science-driven and sort of expert team uh, led by Dave, Dave Revel, who will be uh, talking, who's really versed obviously in coastal geomorphology and, and sea level rise issues and, and coastal issues, including our environmental director, Chris Helmer at the city of ID. But number two, that was completely science driven. So the science is what really permeated all levels of this, but it had to be in a way that we were able to communicate with the public. So we had a very engaged stakeholder process, very, very um, in, involved stakeholder process. And then we had extra funding via the San Diego Foundation and other partners to be able to carry out uh, economic impact analysis. And I think the Coast Conservancy helped out with that as well. So um, that really made the difference. But the final piece that I think was really important is that now we're applying it to a policy arena in terms of our local coastal plan update. So um, it's been an elaborate process. That doesn't mean that it's made it any easier. And I think, you know, we, as we go through these academic exercises, I think we have to obviously um, really understand the real world implication for this at the end of the day we you know this is probably the toughest issue we'll all be dealing with and it's an on what we realize is there's six planning processes and you have to update plans and do policy but the real world implications mean this is an ongoing process and it will be and more importantly the educational piece that chris will talk chris helma from our city will talk about is that we're learning a lot about how you engage the public on this and realize that it we have to keep we have to continue learning about how to do this better so anyway with that um this, this finally ib is a small town but we've embraced our role of leadership on a national and international level as something that's really important it's really important to own sea level rise to acknowledge it to embrace it because the fact is it's here it's staying with us and every time that we um are able to communicate to the public about coastal flooding and coastal storms gives us an opportunity to uh, to understand and address this issue. So with that, I just want to thank our team. Uh, and, and more importantly, I'm glad we're in California with such a robust statewide policy effort. But more importantly, statewide partners like the Coast Conservancy are really supportive of efforts like that of the City of ID. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dave Revel, who's been a tremendous asset. And a lot of this work was done in the water 
uh, sharing waves together, um, and on the beach, which I think is where this, these types of discussions have to happen. Thank you, Serge. Um, so I, um, I was going to, I'm going to talk a bit about the work that we did in 2015 and 2016 on the vulnerability assessment for the city and then subsequent work looking at the physical adaptation responses. This was definitely not work that I did alone. Um, there was a lot, a tremendous steering committee uh, and uh, consulting team. I worked with very closely with Juliet Hart, uh, formerly at USCC Grant, now USGS, um, and Danny Boudreau at the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve, and a variety of other local stakeholders and agencies. So. Um, the steering committee was instrumental in being involved uh, and guiding this process. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the work that we did, uh, then Phil King will talk about the economic impacts uh, and approaches that we took looking at uh, some adaptation strategies. And then Chris uh, will talk about sort of what's been done since we completed the technical work and what lessons are have been learned that could hopefully help other cities uh, and counties around the state um, address similar issues. And then we'll wrap up with some questions and answers. Next slide, please. So for the vulnerability assessment, we looked at uh, four different hazards. We looked at coastal erosion, uh, coastal wave flooding, uh, tidal inundation, and nuisance or stormwater flooding. And uh, Imperial Beach is uniquely situated in that it's surrounded on water by three sides with the uh, Tijuana River Estuary to the south, San Diego Bay to the north, and then the Pacific Ocean to the west. Uh, we focus most of this analysis on the Pacific Coast, the open Pacific Coast, um, and so there's definitely still room for work to be done along the other two coastlines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to look at the different hazards, we relied on several different models. Um, we uh, used the USGS Cosmos uh, model. Um, when it was first released, they had the sort of phase one of the Southern California release. Um, and after some validation, we also incorporated some of the results from the Cosmos 1.0 model. Um, and then we also had the benefit of work being done by the Department of Defense that looked all the way, looked and explicitly mapped coastal erosion hazards. Uh, so we used both of these models to develop sort of a, our suite of approaches. Um, you can see that by, uh, with two meters of sea level rise by, and um, we started to see connections between the Tijuana River estuary and San Diego Bay through the middle of Imperial Beach. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, all of these models assume that there was no adaptation strategies. So that's a big take home message that uh, was useful in, in engaging the public and sort of saying, you know, this is if we do nothing. And so it sort of incentivized things that uh, could, you know, taking some actions collectively. Uh, next slide. The community is no stranger to major storm events. This is uh, photos from the 1983 El Nino. Um, the local dive bar has a, a wall of uh, sort of destruction photos uh, from this same event. Um, next slide, please. So the vulnerability assessment, we uh, work very closely with uh, Russell Mercer, the GIS coordinator for the city, um, and look specifically at these different uh, land, different resource sectors. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but highlight sort of the key findings. During the time, we also had the highest king tide uh, water level uh, recorded at the San Diego tide gauge. And you can see this is the bike path that runs along the perimeter of South San Diego Bay. Next slide, please. Um, the results were mapped uh, and color coded by the timing of impact. Um, this was specifically looking at land uses, and we basically found that uh, with two meters of sea level rise and a 100-year wave event, 
that approximately 30% of all parcels in the city were potentially impacted to some extent. Next slide, please. Um, with uh, looking at the roads, we found that all coastal hazards with, again, two meters of sea level rise and a 100-year event, that about 40% of all of the roads, including the major uh, in, egra ingress and egress and evacuation routes, were also impacted. Next slide. Um, the city also has a history of sort of nuisance and stormwater flooding when hot when precipitation events correspond with high tides. And so this was identified early in the process and with some additional funding, we were able to look at the uh, sort of the stormwater drainage infrastructure and looked at how frequently the, the outfall pipe at either the estuary or San Diego Bay uh, was actually underwater, which would hinder the conveyance of that stormwater out to sea. Um, under the baseline condition, we saw that one of the drainage basins was impacted already 18% of the time. And when we looked at the different sea level rise scenarios up to two meters, we saw a substantial increase where most of the stormwater basins were impacted over 90% of the tide cycle. Um, next slide, please. So the key findings were, uh, with as sea level progresses that there was a substantial decrease in the stormwater capacity substantial increases to the parcels and structures about 30 percent uh, could be impacted and 40 percent of all the roads these were mainly confined to these four vulnerable neighborhoods the south seacoast drive shown uh, at the bottom on the right hand side north of palm avenue and carnation uh, in the upper northwest corner of the city uh, the neighborhood around one of the elementary schools, kind of on the San Diego Bay side, and Seaside Point along the uh, Tijuana River Estuary. Next slide. So as a result of the steering committee, we started to look at different adaptation strategies. Um, and we took sort of a, we looked at both projects and potential policy approaches, um, following sort of the guidance of do nothing, uh, protect uh, with sort of engineered structures uh, or uh, soft uh, nourishment, uh, accommodate with uh, and retreat. And um, next slide, please. And there, this really was uh, a telling piece because as soon as we come up with any kind of vulnerability assessment or hazard zone, and many people have, I'm sure, experienced this, as soon as they, people see these hazard zones, the, the homeowners are asking, what's my house going to be worth in 30 years? The community is asking, what's my beach uh, going to be like in 30 years? And the politicians are trying to make everybody happy. <laughs> and then it all comes down really to who, how much does it cost and who pays? Next slide, please. All of the adaptation stra uh, strategies have a variety of secondary impacts. Um, you know, seawalls, uh, you know, do, do not save beaches, but rather destroy beaches and potentially views and affect access. But construction costs, maintenance costs, uh, beach ecology, beach recreation, and aesthetics are all secondary impacts that need to be considered. And uh, to the best we can, uh, try and quantify them as we evaluate the appropriateness and the timing of when these strategies become become cost effective or um, stop being cost effective. Next slide, please. So with through the steering committee process, we identified five of the most uh, potentially feasible alternatives. One was sort of hardening and armoring of the entire Imperial Beach coastline. One was a managed retreat or phase relocation. Uh, a third was business as usual in sand nourishment, which has occurred periodically in Imperial Beach history. And then the, the third was, uh, the fourth one was more of a living shoreline approach, looking at a cobble, dynamic cobble berm or revetment and uh, dune uh, development over the top of it. Uh, and then the final one was uh, sort of a 
sand retention effort to look at the extension of the north growing and other uh, associated growings that had been originally conceived by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, many decades ago. And we were applying these strategies to the urbanized per portion of the city. Next slide, please. Um, so for each of the adaptation strategy, uh, we conducted some physical modeling and sort of track the various beach widths. You can see along the top of this slide the, the different sort of compartments or, uh, or widths along that beach profile. And we tracked each of these widths through time and compared primarily the beach widths with the upland width uh, and then evaluated both the physical and economic ramifications over multiple time horizons, uh, including some accounting of recreation and uh, a small portion of habitat valuation. Uh, and then we also assume sort of an initial narrow uh, or uh, wide beach condition because the, the beach widths do range um, down here and have throughout, um, you know, sort of the air photo historic record. Next slide, please. So the coastal armoring results, um, really we found that the dry sand beaches uh, potentially as early disappear between 2050 and 2075 and by as early potentially as 2035 to 2065 we may only have damp sand intertidal beaches. Um, again these the model was did not directly look at a major storm impact thrown in here but relied rather on an acceleration of historic erosion rates. Next slide please. Uh, you can see some of the his, historic changes um, that uh, the, you know, in Imperial Beach when the sand has been lost and a lot of the, and you quickly lose the beach and recreational opportunities and affect uh, beach access. Next slide. We also looked at the other end member of this, which is managed retreat. Um, I like to think of this as getting out of the way gracefully rather than running from the hurricane storm surge or tsunami. Um, this uh, assumption assumed that we allowed erosion to occur. We did look at several different implementation options. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about some of that. Um, and then we sort of uh, looked at timing of the removal of uh, the structures. Um, real, what we found from this analysis is that the beach is maintained, um, but potential development up to three parcels inland could be affected. Next slide, please. When we looked at sort of a business as usual sand nourishment project um, and maintaining the armoring, we found that uh, a nourishment cycle would be required nine to 11 times uh, to maintain a recreational beach width and that the nourishment cycle uh, narrowed from about 15 years down to five years at the latter end of the uh, century. Next slide, please. But the key there was that the upland was protected. The natural hybrid dune that we looked at was based on sort of the historic ecology of this area um, and included components of beach nourishment, cobble nourishment, removal of the existing revetments and seawalls, and a dune restoration. Um, if you hit the animation here, you can see the extensive field of cobbles um, that get exposed during following major storm events. We found that this was uh, had better longevity and uh, required about eight reconstruction cycles by 2100. Next slide, please. And then finally, the sand retention with the growings, um, based on the original Army Corps of Engineers project um, with some expansion, um, was uh, retain sand longer so that nourishment cycles were only, only required about six to seven times by 2100. Next slide, please. So uh, sort of in summary of the adaptation, the armoring was found to lose cost beach recreation and ecological value as the beach is lost. The dunes and nourishment has, a, has high long-term cost, and a lot of that was due to some of our assumptions. Um, but increasing cost and shorter construction cycles over time. Um, but I think some, you know, more information analysis is probably necessary if this is going to be the long-term strategy to consider 
hybrids with sand retention, certain grain sizes, and better inclusion of the ecological valuation. Um, the short-term armoring in the growing seemed about even in terms of overall net benefits. Over the midterm, managed retreat and the growings had similar net benefits. And over the long term, managed retreat had the highest net benefits, um, basic, based primarily on the public benefits of recreation and ecological value, as well as all the avoided construction and maintenance costs offset um, that is, you know, and we considered the losses of infrastructure and private property in that. And so I'll talk more about that. But I think one of the things that a lot of jurisdictions are struggling with is this idea of managed retreat. And I just want to sort of say that manage, there's a lot of ways to implement managed retreat. And it's something I think a lot of the communities have been doing without calling it managed retreat for a long time. And so I hope that we can, as a community, find better ways to have this discussion around how to implement managed retreat and keep it in the mix as we go forward in policy discussions. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil. Hi. Um, that was a good um, sort of overview of the economic analysis as well, in a way. So my name is Phil King. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of this work, as some of you know. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to very quickly go over the economic methodology. Um, it's similar, as I mentioned a minute ago, to a number of other projects that I've worked on, including Southern Monterey Bay 1 and 2, Oxnard, Ventura County, Pacifica, Oceanside, et cetera. And I've worked on those with Dave and ESA and the Nature Conservancy and a number of other folks. Um, so this basic economic method starts with the parcel data that comes from the county. So we looked at the assessed property values for parcels and we can divide that between land and structures uh, and we've developed techniques which i won't go into which are in the report if you'd like to read it in chapter six the econ section that everybody skips over it is all there um, but we adjusted the assessed values to market values um, and we applied something called the c-spat model which looks at the recreational value of beaches based on beach width again that's explained in more detail in the uh, report but essentially the wider the beach the more recreational value up to a certain point up to about 250 feet we worked with the city uh, of imperial beach to estimate and evaluate public property since it's not assessed there's no property tax valuation but the city was actually extremely helpful in helping us determine that the one um issue there was federal property as many of you know there's quite a bit of federal property there the navy seals train there um and the navy seals didn't answer my emails uh so we have some valuations for the federal property but that's somewhat incomplete we also conducted a sensitivity analysis uh, which i won't go into but it's all in the report um next slide please um this is just a big takeaway here these are the losses for 0.5 meters, one meter, and two meters of sea level rise. And you can see, not surprisingly, they go up over time. Um, but also you can see that the erosion losses in terms of the economic losses, in terms of the dollar signs, the erosion losses are the most significant losses for the city of Imperial Beach. That's not um, unusual, but it does vary from city to city. Um, event flooding becomes much more significant over time. Tidal flooding is also a problem now. It's more of a nuisance probably today, although the people who live uh, next to the coast probably consider it more than a nuisance, uh, but it's gonna sig increase significantly over time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide, I'm just gonna try to summarize a little bit more succinctly. I, I stared at the slide all morning. Essentially, this is a benefit cost analysis. Uh, the benefits are basically the beach recreation, which we measured using the CSPAT model, and we also measured ecological benefits. Now, the, the metric that we use to measure ecological benefits is relatively simple, and some might even argue crude. Uh, it's based on a percentage of the uh, replacement cost. I have an article coming out in Shore and Beach uh, with Jenny Dugan, Dave Harbert, Kerry Martin. Chad Nelson and Bob Battaglia, and any day now, 
um, managing beach ecosystems in an age of retreat, which explains this method in a lot more detail. So we did account for beach ecosystems other than recreation and other than storm buffering, um, but it's a you know relatively crude metric. We apply we looked at the cost. In terms of the engineering costs, which we're going to see in a second, we looked at the cost of replacing structures based on the parcel values. We looked at the cost of replacing government structures and infrastructure based on information we received from the city and from various municipal um, utilities. Uh, and we looked at um, basically all the costs that we could include. We include su some demolition costs for um, retreat as well. Um, so next slide, please. Um, this is just a summary of the implementation costs. You can look at this later on. Actually, we can skip this slide. And this is the money shot. This is the big, you know, that everybody looks at and wonders how to interpret this. And to go back to what Dave said earlier, if you look at the green bar on the right, that's basically what's happening by 2100. And so you can see that the net benefits of retreat, at least, you know, if you accept the methods that we use in this study, retreat pencils out or has the highest net benefits over time. And this is something that I've seen in a lot of studies I've worked on. When I go into these studies, I don't have any preconceived notion of what's going to happen. I did not expect retreat to pencil out when I first started doing this work several years ago, but what I'm amazed at is the more I look at this, the more retreat often does pencil out. However, in the medium term, by that I'm saying, you know, 2047, 2069, 0.5 meter, one meter sea level rise, we have a lot of variation there. And as Dave pointed out, um, the Army Corps solution actually does seem to pencil out at least by 2069. But if you look over the short term, the next 20 or 30 years, there isn't a lot of difference between dunes and nourishment, um, and maybe even nourishment with groins. So part of this also depends on what the community values are. If the city of Imperial Beach wanted dune restoration, and if they decided that the ecological value of dune restoration was somehow greater than the ecological value of other restoration, I think that's you know within the margin of error here, frankly. So I don't think you should look at these results and say, well, this is one dollar higher than another, or this is slightly higher. You're really looking for the big takeaways here. Long-term retreat, short-term, actually, I would say the city has quite a few options, but Mother Nature does want to retreat here. And I think also the community has to decide over the next 20 or 30 years where they want to put their resources, what sorts of values are the most important. Is it going to be beach nourishment, which would increase recreation? Is it going to be dune restoration, which might have more ecological value? Or armoring, which would protect private property? Or retreat, which is certainly politically difficult, but as we've seen over the long haul, retreat does seem to lead to the highest net benefits. So next slide, please. Now, we've had a lot of discussion about managed retreat. And I, in some ways, I think we should stop using the word manage because I don't think we've totally figured out how this process is supposed to occur. We've had retreat in California, but it hasn't really been managed all that well. And, you know, homeowners have been extremely upset about this. This is a poster from the city of Pacifica on the right hand side, but I've seen the same thing in Oxnard and I'm sure it's true in Imperial Beach. And I've been to meetings, and I'm sure many of you have, where homeowners are literally screaming and yelling because they're worried about losing their property. So that's a huge political issue as well as an economic issue for many local communities. So what we decided to do, Dave and I sat down at the end of the project. We had no budget left, of course, but we said, look, we need to do something uh, in terms of penciling out how managed retreat would work. So Dave actually did suggest that I look at a fee simple acquisition uh, program, which is something that often is discussed under managed retreat. So next slide, please. <clears throat> and the diagram on the right, which I'm going to explain in a second, sort of tells you how this fee simple program would work. 
So in fact, let me go to that right now. Um, this is basically, the diagram on the right is a payback scheme. If you look at the lowest line, this is how long it would take to pay back a property if the government or some nonprofit bought out the home and rented it back at current market rates, either to the current owner or tenant or to somebody else. And presumably the current owner or tenant would have you know, first right of refusal. Um, this is a couple of years ago when interest rates were lower. And you can see that given interest rates two years ago, if you follow the gray line, in 48 years, you can pay off 90% of the value of the property. I don't know if everybody can see that. There is going to be a quiz after this. I forgot to say that. Um, but what we decided to do, my RA Jeff Gilliam and I said, well, what if we exempt property tax? Because if it's bought out by a local jurisdiction or a nonprofit, it typically would not be subject to property tax. If you take away the property tax, you shift up to the blue line. The, the yellow line is just half of the property tax. We should probably take that out. So that actually gives you a situation where the payoff of 100% is just over 30 years. It's like 31 years, which is about the length of a typical mortgage. So we said, aha, you know, you could actually make this work in 30 years, this, the time of a typical mortgage. And that basically means that nobody would be stuck with a loss. The homeowners would get their money back, the city or whoever would not lose any money, assuming that, you know, Mother Nature didn't get angry, um, and everybody's better off. In the meantime, interest rates have risen in the last year and a half. I'm sure all of you follow the 10-year treasury bond every day like I do. Um, but now we're back to the gray line, even exempting the property tax. So essentially, a lease buyback program could pay back some of the loss, but somebody would also have to absorb the loss. So what I, I thought about this a little bit further, and I said, well, what about transfer of development rights? The other option that people often mention is you could buy the property, uh, allow people to put their house on another plot of land that the city would provide. Um, so next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I, I actually I shouldn't have done that. But anyway, let me just continue the discussion here. Basically, um, if you buy back the property, give the owners land to move their property somewhere else, uh, you could come up with a fee simple solution coupled with a transfer of development rights solution that would pencil out and probably work. But I think this is something that we need to think about more in the future, and I've been thinking about quite a bit in the last six months, actually is how are we gonna make the economics of managed retreat work? I know a lot of people are focused on the legal implications, but we also need to make it pencil out. And it's probably going to require some land or some other government subsidy, some exemption from property tax, but it is something that we can make work. So next slide, please. Economic lessons learned. I'm gonna throw in a couple of other things I didn't mention, one of the things, that I think is also worth mentioning is that people react better to sea level rise levels, preferably in feet, than they do in timelines. So if instead of saying 2030, 2060, or 2049, 2069, you could say 0.5 meters, one meters, or the equivalent in feet and inches. Um, nobody likes discount rates. I didn't talk about that much, um, but discount rates are, are a significant issue here. We need to have better metrics for tidal flooding than we do. And as I mentioned a minute ago, we really don't have managed and managed retreat. We need to focus more on the economic feasibility of managed retreat. And that's my 15 minutes of fame. All right, thanks, Phil. Um, I appreciate it, um, all the, the discussion up to this point. I'm gonna bring the discussion back to a local level here. And uh, here in the city of Imperial Beach, we're currently in the middle of updating what we call our local coastal program. I'm going to be calling it LCP through this talk. And in the city of Imperial Beach, our LCP is our city's general plan. Um, in addition to that, we're currently developing a climate action plan, and we're also, uh, as part of this effort, uh, developing a complete streets plan. The real purpose for these policy updates is to help create a more resilient and sustainable community here in Imperial Beach. 
One important element of our LCP update is establishment of our first policies in the city related to sea level rise. And I wish that creating new policy was as simple as just following the science and the economics. But what we really learned in our community and in other communities is that an equal important part of this process is getting this, uh, the social and the public acceptance of new sea level rise policy, which often takes time to mature and evolve. Uh, the 2016 sea level rise study that uh, was the first time that our community actually held public meetings to identify the vulnerabilities of sea level rise. Uh, we had public meetings that were the most attended in our city history. We had over 300 people um, at some of our public workshops. And it was our hope when we went into our LCP update that this momentum of public involvement would carry through. Uh, but unfortunately, it kind of fizzled out and we really have a minimal level of involvement with, with local re residents at this time in our LCP update. So one of the lessons learned through our current LCP update is that the city's LCP is complicated. My background is engineering and in public works and, and I'm often confused and, and can find myself asking the, the, the city planners questions on, on LCP and why are we doing it this way? Um, it also requires a large time commitment for anyone participating in the process and it's not easy to follow for anyone who is really not into city planning. So this is particularly true for new policies related to sea level rise, which require time for the community to understand and to accept these new policies. So, next slide. One of the important messages that we keep reiterating through our LCP process is that our sea level rise models and our projections assumes that there's no adaptation measures to protect the shore, which is currently not the case. It's also worth noting that our sea level rise models also show that we can actually accommodate uh, one and a half feet of sea level rise without, without actually changing any of our adaptation measures at this current moment. Next slide. I kind of wanted to show some of our, our uh, existing adaptation measures. Uh, this is kind of what I call our conventional shoreline protection. This is the south end of Seacoast Drive. Um, and this is probably the most vulnerable section of our coast right now, um, where we have existing riprap. I call this kind of the, the old school conventional shoreline protection and, and the sea level rise study that, that Dave and Phil worked on. One of the phased retreat strategies on here is actually pulling back this riprap, getting back 50 more feet of the beach, and then replacing it with a seawall. That's just one plausible way in, in order to implement some phased um, adaptation along this line. Next slide. Uh, another important component uh, is beach nourishment. This is a picture of our 2003 beach nourishment project. Beneficial beach nourishment is most definitely going to continue into the future. Uh, the city is currently working to update um, what's called a scoop permit. It's our beneficial uh, nourishment permit that allows us to place uh, sand on the beach. Uh, what we're doing in updating our permit is, is now actually going to allow us to place um, sand, cobbles, along anywhere along the stretch of our coast from uh, to the north to Coronado all the way down south to the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's going to allow us to place near shore, onshore, or in dune placements on it. So we're trying to gain more flexibility for us to, to um, implement new adaptation measures uh, within, our, within the flexibility of our permitting process. Next slide, please. Uh, another example I really wanted to show is if you go to the south end of our beach, uh, we've got the best example probably in Southern California of a living shoreline. And this is a living shoreline that's in front of the Tijuana estuary there. Um, if you actually look at an aerial image, you see over time how this cobble sand berm has actually migrated inland. I mean, this is, a, is an excellent example of how a shoreline manages over time. And in the future, we're looking to hopefully use some of the sand that's in the Tijuana River Valley. Um, there's an excess amount of sand that's coming down and eroding from Mexico and depositing into the Tijuana River Valley. And we're working with estuary staff on a sediment management plan and one of the beneficial reuses of the sediment is actually placing it on the beach. And, and we think it would be great to test some ideas on how if we place this down south of the river mouth um, to do some, some dunes or some living shorelines and just see how it affects on the beach. Next slide, please. Uh, I also want to throw this on. Um, here's a photo that you can see on, on the lower side that, that uh, uh, part of our city used to historically always flood. And, and part of the problem with this is the, on Seacoast Drive, the, the homes that are right on the, the beach side 
are higher in elevation than the street and the businesses that are further inland. And, and historically, our city would flood during large rain, rain events and large storms. You probably saw some photos of this earlier in, in, in Dave's presentation. So about eight years ago, we installed a stormwater pump station down at uh, Seacoast and Palm Avenue. And since then, it's really resolved this ongoing flooding issue that we've had along the old Palm Avenue and on portions of Seacoast Shut. But the, the interesting lesson learned from this is that um, so it's only been maybe around eight years since the installed pump station. If you talk to the residents and businesses along that stretch, they would swear that street has never flooded in the past. So everyone has really short-term memories. Next slide, please. Uh, another important adaptation measure, which is a key component of our LCP update, is including green streets into our capital improvement project. Uh, green streets are just smart. Um, essentially, what we're doing here in Imperial Beach is we're trying to punch holes in our our, our our existing hardened infrastructure in the city and just allow areas for stormwater to retain and to infiltrate into the ground wherever possible. This helps with the existing low-line areas and the flooding that we've had in the city. Uh, this is also an awesome climate adaptation strategy that we're promoting. Next slide, please. Uh, additional green streets, we're doing green alleys. Just last year, the city completed uh, over two miles of green alleys. This is just an alley with uh, stormwater uh, permeable concrete down the middle and some retention system in the middle. Uh, it's a good project, another smart way that, that we're just modernizing infrastructure in the city. Next slide, please. Uh, we're also partnering with redevelopment projects in the city. Uh, what we're doing is we're enlarging our stormwater retention areas that are part of new development projects to actually capture uh, runoff that's coming from the public right-of-way. Uh, this is an easy, low-cost way to, to, to accommodate more stormwater capture. Next slide, please. And finally, I, I wanted to give a pitch on this. This is one of our current projects. It's a Imperial Beach Boulevard enhancement, which we're doing. Um, the, the namesake street of our city, Imperial Beach Boulevard, we are modernizing it from the beach all the way to our city limits. But one of the really cool and key components of this is we're doing a, a large enhancement at a 26-foot wide multi-use boardwalk in front of the Tijuana Estuary. We're partnering with Tijuana Estuary staff and, and the reserve managers. Um, and so we're not only doing green streets along the whole way, we're also doing a really good um, enhancement in front of the Tijuana Estuary. So I hope you guys come out in about a year and you can check out this project. Next slide, please. One of the major outcomes of our sea level rise study is that adaptation decisions can and need to be phased over time. This was a major innovative approach that emerged from our sea level rise study. Uh, this graphic actually came from our sea level rise uh, study that Dave worked on. Dave and our consulting team came up with a phase trigger approach to adaptation planning, which is now kind of the framework of our new sea level rise policies in our LCP. Uh, next slide, please. So why are triggers so important? Well, first and foremost, triggers are the best way to gain public acceptance for our adaptation pathways. We need to get away from sea level rise as a polarizing political issue to a manageable issue that still allows Imperial Beach to be a prosperous community. If the preferred or only option is managed retreat and your community is surrounded on three sides by rising sea levels, your community will essentially be eliminated over time, both physically and economically. In addition, the science is still evolving. The science behind sea level rise continues to advance, and really it needs to advance in order to minimize the range of potential options of expected sea level sea level rise or sea level elevations in the future. I mean, for example, we know IB can accommodate the first one and a half feet of sea level rise without much change in our current adaptation efforts. What we don't know at this time and is that what year will the polar ice caps start failing, which could then lead to rapid increases of sea level that is potentially unmanageable. Adaptation strategies are also evolving. There's not one single approach to effective adaptation and depending on the event, the event severity, and event frequency, different strategies or combinations of strategies will need to be utilized over time. We'll also anticipate that there will be new and additional strategies not currently identified that will be developed over time and will enhance resilience and adaptation. It is critical that our LCP accommodates these future unknown strategies. And what I probably should have added to this list is that our triggers may also change. For example, just this week, the city was notified by State Farm Insurance that they have a new nationwide policy not to insure 
properties that are within a thousand feet of the coast. If insurance companies decide to adopt similar policies, then this would change the economics of coastal real estate across the country, not just IB. Finally, retreat is not an immediate consideration, but it's still an important option that is part of our current LCP update. We expect our current LCP to have a shelf life somewhere around 10 to 20 years and manage retreat under our existing models may not be necessary until the 50 year mark. Next slide, please. So I can't remember who said this quote, but patience is the calm acceptance that things can happen in a different order than the one you have in mind. So this quote kind of nicely frames the context of which we're, we're approaching sea level rise and updating our LCP. Next slide, please. So lessons learned. I think if it's not abundantly clear that ongoing stakeholder engagement is still necessary. It also helps to have political support from your elected officials to help encourage this dialogue. Our solutions need to seek ways to embrace sea level rise whenever possible. Conservation is in the DNA of our community. That is why two thirds of our city is protected open space in the Tijuana estuary and is currently not a boat marina. The community of IB supports green solutions and our adaptation in the future will, will reflect this core value. We also need to keep our LCP policy simple and adaptable. Now we can always add more detail later and that is what we're gonna be doing. Manager retreat is an option that needs further work and needs to address the fears with practical achievable steps. The problem with managed retreat is that it triggers emo everyone's reptilian emotion. I think it's called a reptilian mind. This is the fight or flight mechanism that people have. And this is really the, the concern that we don't want to raise within our community. Next slide. So the next step, I still think the best years are still ahead of us in Imperial Beach and preparing for sea level rise does not need to stop economic development in the, in the city. There's a lot of next steps we need to take. We need to assess, do a deeper analysis on what triggers are and how to actually measure and have observable monitoring for these triggers. Uh, we definitely need to look into sediment management and opportunities for the future beach nourishment projects. We need to look at our hazard mitigation plans and then have the city be prepared as if there is a big disaster in the community that we actually rebuild in a smart way. And I really do need to link our adaptation strategies to economic development projects. And that's really the only way that we can start gaining public support for many of these. And there's additional efforts that need to understand economic evaluation of ecological values and policy approaches, additional analysis of managed routine implementation. Next slide, please. So I'd like to end just say the city can't adapt to climate change alone. We need local, regional, state, national, and international partners. And I think IB is a great testing ground to start testing some of these adaptation strategies in the future. So I think with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Coast Conservancy staff. Great, thank you, Chris and Bill and Dave for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, so folks attending the webinar, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them, um, type them out in that questions box. Um, and we have about 15 or so minutes to have some question and answer time. So we have plenty of time. While those questions are coming in, um, all three of you touched on manage retreat as a topic, and I'm wondering if we can just kind of revisit it for a moment. Um, especially Dave, you had mentioned that there are many ways to implement manage retreat, so I'm wondering if any one of you could touch on what those different ways might be to implement manage retreat. Yeah, thank you, Carrie, and thanks everybody for the, the presentations, Chris and Serge and Phil. Um, you know, I think that as we go through the process to discuss managed retreat, I think that there are ways, I mean, Phil talked a lot about, you know, what, how much does it cost to purchase and to lease back and how effective can that be? Um, I think tying into local FEMA repetitive loss programs concepts where three strikes and maybe you're not out, but maybe the, the local jurisdiction has an opportunity or right of first refusal to purchase that property at the damaged value. Um, there's, 
you know, there are sort of, you know, rolling easements, which I know has gotten a lot of attention in the uh, sort of the legal uh, legal literature about the feasibility and potential uh, risk to takings claims. Um, but I think the sooner we start adding in programs and policies that uh, reduce the city's liabilities and put more of the uh, responsibility for uh, damages in the, the homeowner's hands, uh, I think it's going to be a lot less controversial to start doing some of these programs now before we're starting to see a lot of different things uh, go wrong quickly. Um, if I can jump in here, I would just second most of what Dave said. Um, from an economic perspective, managed retreat involves somebody losing money. Either the homeowner loses money or some other agency will subsidize some of that loss. And you know, FEMA has been famous for bailing out homeowners over and over again, mostly uh, in on the East Coast, much less on the West Coast, but some out here. Um, FEMA is going to run out of money at some point in my perspective, but there's going to have to be a government agency, I believe, that will probably have to subsidize this or homeowners will absorb all the loss, which from a political perspective is probably not feasible, whether you think that's fair or not. Um, and so I think we need to start thinking about ways in which we can make this work. And I think, if, as I said earlier, a fee simple acquisition program coupled with transfer of development rights. We talk a lot about transfer of development rights, but I would like to see a city implement that. The city of Pacifica does has actually allocated some land for transfer of development rights. So I think there's an opportunity to implement a transfer of development rights project somewhere in California, possibly an IB. And I think it's also possible to implement a program, a lease buyback program, but it would probably require somebody with deep pockets because there is a potential loss. But I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities for managed retreat. We have the time right now. Unlike the East Coast, we actually probably have another 20, 30, 40 years in many towns before this is gonna be a problem. It's, it's a problem already in Pacifica in some spots, but there are many places where we have the time, but we need to act now or in the next couple of years. Great, and I think those are all good points. Yeah, I was going to add a little more onto it. So that was all good points. Uh, last week, I was actually at a sustainability conference that was in uh, um, Denver, and I got a chance to really talk with public work structures, um, one from Florida, one from Texas, and one from North Carolina. And I actually asked them the questions of, what would it take, and these are cool community, what would it take for your community to start implementing managed retreat? And they really, their answers were, you really needed event based triggers, or you need, well, they're talking about hurricanes, but they're talking about these these large storm events, and then having the right incentives in place so the coastal homeowners make the right decisions. Um, they're very concerned on their end, and rightfully so, about uh, losing, taking rights away from people, and then the city's being liable for that. But if you, ha if you set up the right incentives, and, and I think FEMA really is the, the good framework for some of this to maybe be happening, and since you know, East Coast really is dealing with some of these issues way before we're we're majorly issuing here in, in California. I, I hope some of this larger acceptance um, will evolve over time, and we can start putting in some of these right incentives. Where if a if an area gets damaged, that you get more money to relocate than to rebuild at the time. I mean, that's just maybe one example. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on from manager treat, there's a question about what were the consultant costs for the different elements or deliverables presented? Um, I guess I'll take this one. Um, this was uh, funded in part, um, well, I would say that a lot of this work was sort of pioneering at the time, and so we sort of made do with what funding was available. Um, it certainly didn't cover a lot of the costs and efforts and weekends and nights, but um, I think the whole budget for this work was uh, was in the $130,000 range with, um, you know, sort of a lot of uncompensated time and uh, involvement from the city and uh, as well as, you know, sort of stuff that the consultants sort of just did above and beyond. 
Um, you know, I don't think Tijuana River uh, and Danny's time was covered. So there, it was a lot more extensive um, than the actual physical dollar value. But I think the in-kind and matching was around, uh, or in, or the actual cash was around 130 or so. Yeah, that, that's kind of true. And in general, with our consultant contracts, we, we get a lot more value out of them than, than what we actually pay them. Um, that, that is very much true with our current LCP update where, uh, uh, where we're tasking our consultants probably with twice as much work than we're actually paying them right now. All right. Uh, the next question is, how did you get private utility providers to answer questions in developing an LCP or informing homeowners? Uh, well, part of our LCP update is we actually have a steering committee and a stakeholder group. So uh, it, it's a matter of just inviting them and being part of our steering committee or the stakeholder group. And in our current LCP, uh, the utility companies are part of our steering committee. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then I'm being told as well, we also are doing a same amount of just public outreach that are uh, within the community. And, and we, we tend to go where the public are. So in, in, in our city, uh, we do it along special events, we do it at the, at the farmer's market, and we do it at the beach. That's, that's kind of the key area to be able to, to, to connect with the public. Uh, this is Dave. I would, um, you know, in terms of the private utilities uh, and infrastructure, a lot of the infrastructure, water supply, and wastewater in particular, tend to be districts that, uh, you know, you can get that information. Uh, with the private sort of electric, natural gas infrastructure, those tend to be very proprietary, uh, e either with San Diego Gas and Electric in this point or PG&E elsewhere in the state. Um, there was some work that I was involved with as part of the fourth climate assessment that looked at private utilities uh, uh, impacts to sea level rise uh, as part of that. Um, but that, in terms of this Imperial Beach work, we were not successful in getting utility information. Um, one thing I did learn through the uh, fourth assessment work, uh, which is out and available, is that there are, you know, the utilities are going to continue to provide service to wherever development is permitted. Um, and so I think it's going to be, you know, and they'll put in safeguards as they're, you know, sort of reacting to wildfires uh, around the state and the Im implications of that to reduce their own risk. But I think it's going to be up to the communities to sort of plan where development goes and utility providers will respond by sort of discontinuing service to those vulnerable areas. But I don't think they're going to take the lead. All right, we have a couple more questions here. Did Phil King's study look at the cost to maintain infrastructure in high-risk areas? I'm not sure which infrastructure. In general, we looked at replacement costs for infrastructure. Um, we tried to look at the cost of maintenance for infrastructure, but you know there may have been some things. Again, you just heard that the study was done on a pretty small budget, and the economics is a small percentage obviously of the total so we tried to do the best we could we did look at replacement costs for infrastructure we tried to look at updating infrastructure for flooding et cetera, et cetera. but i can't say we were 100 percent complete on that all right and this can um be our one of our last questions um are most homeowners on Seacoast Sea Drive accepting managed retreat as a trigger-based adaptation strategy to be included within the LCP? If so, can you describe how you reached consensus? For example, what talking points or messages were most effective in this regard? Uh, well, it's ongoing. There's definitely no consensus yet. Um, that's kind of why, I mean, our LCP is going to include managed retreat as an option, but it's something that's out in the future. But it's, it's something that, that needs a lot more work and needs more meat on the bone um, later. Uh, and, and that's literally what the city's planning on doing is uh, we'll, we'll continue this, this discussion for the next couple decades, I suspect, until something naturally happens. <laughs> 
Great. And um, Chris, maybe you could talk, do you have any talking points or messages that have been effective or that you plan on using? I'm, I, I think kind of the, the big message, kind of where, I, where I, I started out is we have time in the city. I mean, our, our, the models are showing that we can accommodate a foot and a half of sea level rise, and there's still time to, to um, develop adaptation strategies. So there is nothing imminent. There's no, there's no reason to panic. It's like the Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy book, you know. Don't panic. That, that's kind of how I feel sometimes in, in these meetings. Um, so no reason to rush into making any rash decisions on what we're doing, and the city's not going to make any rash decisions. Um, we're going to keep working with our, our folks here at the estuary, the folks down at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, the, with Dave and with Phil, and, and evolving these adaptation strategies at a state level. Um, and I think IB is really a good testing ground to start testing some ideas and bouncing them back and forth, because really our community seems to be able to have a, uh, um, a at least a rational discussion on these. Um, other, other communities seem to have a, a more knee-jerk reptilian response, but in our community, we're able to have some, some rational discussions, and, and we hope to just keep the dialogue and, and expanding on the dialogue on, on adaptation strategies as, as we move forward. All right. Um, and we will end with our final question. Um, have you already begun conversations with the Coastal Commission? What is their position on the sea level rise policies you have proposed? Has there been any pushback? Yeah, the, the Coast Commission has actually has probably provided the most comments on our LCP, and they're probably one of the, the more involved in uh, responding and providing comments to us. Yeah, they're part of the process. Uh, I, I, I think they're supportive of, of what we're, we're proposing in there right now. Uh, yeah, it's still in the process. So it, it, it hasn't hasn't been adopted, and, and we're actually having a, a workshop November. coming up. What is it? November fourteenth. If you guys want to put it on your calendar, we'll, we'll have it on our city's website. Um. All right. Well, it's a couple of minutes after three, so I want to be respectful of, of people's time. But thanks everyone for sticking in here. This is an incredibly interesting webinar. Thank you to the uh, three of you speakers for joining us and for all of you uh, Coastal Resilience Network members who have joined as well. Um, as I said, this has been recorded and I'll send out a link to that recording um, by the end of the day, the day today. But otherwise, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.